Hello. My aim over the next 15 minutes is to explain a bit about how human factors and ergonomics can be used in coma. It's always quite dangerous to use jargon and acronyms in the title of a webinar or presentation. Just to avoid any confusion, COMA stands for the Control of Major Accident Hazards. This is actually a UK regulation that came about to implement the European Cerveso Directive. The term is used more widely as a general approach to managing the risks of major accidents, which are typically things like fires, explosions, toxic releases, things that can harm multiple people or cause significant damage to the environment. As a general recognition that human error is a significant cause of major accidents and that as a result, people who are able to apply human factors in this setting can be in great demand. The purpose of this webinar is to give you an idea of how you can apply your human factors and ergonomic skills in the coma industries. You know, one important thing to recognise is that the approaches that may be effective for personal health and safety are not really enough for coma, where it is the safety of the process that is most important. So in this pr short presentation, I hope to give you some idea about how you can position yourself to work in coma. What we find is some principles transfer easily between, between industrial sectors, but others do not. It would be exactly the same if I were contemplating working in aviation, railways, medical, military, uh, something like that. We suggested that you watch the video summarising the accident at BP Texas City that occurred in 2005 because it gives a really good overview of the accident and causes, many of which are related to human factors. Here's a quick summary in case you didn't get the chance. It happened when the plant was being restarted after maintenance. Several failures meant that a distillation tower was overfilled, which led to a large quantity of flammable material being released. This ignited and the fire and explosion unfortunately killed 15 workers and injured 180 others. Although this incident occurred in America, where the coma regulations do not apply, it's worth noting that there are nearly a thousand sites in the UK that handle major accident hazards, and so similar incidents could occur. Now, every sector de develops its own language, and it will really help if you know what people are talking about when you're working with them. Now, hopefully, if you watch the video, um, you will have picked up some of the, uh, the terminology and you will have noticed that the, the source of the hazard was what's known as the isomerization or isom unit. Now, it's not particularly important that you understand what this means, but it will help if you are familiar with the, the sort of standard types of equipment that make up the process plants. The piece of equipment that was the source of the liquid that was ultimately released from the vent was the raffinate splitter tower. But to keep you on your toes, this will invariably shorten to the splitter or described as a tower or a column. And these terms are used pretty interchangeably. But useful to understand that it was really a very large vessel, 170 feet tall or 50 meters. You know, that's half a football pitch or two lengths of your normal leisure center swimming pool. Now, from your ergonomics background, you may be starting to ask, well, OK, that's a very tall structure. How do people get to the top of the column? Is there a lift or an elevator? And you may be concerned to hear that actually it's by ladder. And you'd you know, be starting to ask, well, how wide is the ladder? What's the distance between the rungs? Now, this is all very valid questions to ask when you're looking at the design of something like this. But just bear in mind that access to the top of that tower, whilst it is something that is done, has absolutely no relevance to the accident that occurred in this case. So this is what I mean between personal health and safety and coma and major accidents, it really introduces different issues that need to be considered. The purpose of the splitter tower or column was to separate components using distillation. This means heating up a liquid so that the lighter or lower boiling point components are vaporized. The same happens in a whiskey still, but the difference there is when you're making whiskey, you tend to fill the still up and heat it up and the distillation is completed as a batch. On a process plant like at Texas City, it's a continuous process. The diagram on the right uh, shows a typical arrangement and it would be useful if you can read these types of drawings and have some idea of what the components do. The column, I think, is quite easy to recognise. It's the tall, thin thing. You will see items called condenser and reboiler. These are used to heat or cool fluids, the heat exchangers. 
Um, you will see that there's a reflux drum. This is simply another vessel where liquids are collected. And the small yellow symbol um, is a pump for transferring liquids from one place to another. One thing to be aware of, might seem a bit quirky, is that we put liquid into the column, that's shown as the feed. We also get liquid out of the top of the column, which is described as distillate, and the bottom of the column as bottoms, imaginative title. But in normal operation, the column should be mostly filled with vapour. So yeah, it does seem a bit strange. There's liquid in, liquid out, but actually most of it is vapour. Um, one of the causes of the, the accident at Texas City was too much liquid built up inside the column. So how can you use your human factors knowledge in, in this sort of setting? Well, one very valid topic that you can ask about is situational awareness. As I said earlier, it was what was happening inside the splitter tower that was most significant to this accident. Um, the operators cannot see directly inside, it's made of steel, and so they have to understand what is happening using other mechanisms. So instrumentation, telling them what's going on inside the, the, the column, and some sort of mental model about the distillation process that's taking place inside. So one question you may ask is whether it was good enough for the operators that the liquid level measurement only reached up to nine feet of the 170 feet high tower. So it was only showing 5% of the, of the total level that you would think was possible in the tower. Now, if you'd asked that question, you probably would have got the explanation. Well, during normal operation, the level was only usually at six feet. So nine feet range was more than enough. But you know, your role would be to ask questions of the operators who are essentially our end users. What's the user experience? And it's pretty likely that they would have, you know, they would tell you that, well, that might be what's normal operation, but there are other times, for example, startup, where the level routinely goes above nine feet. So the situational awareness is, is badly affected by this, this design decision um, to only provide a limited uh, level indication on that, on, on that vessel. Now, one reason why liquid built up in the tower was that a valve on the outlet at the bottom was closed. Now, a valve is like a, a kitchen tap. When you turn it on, it opens and allows liquid to flow through it. So hopefully it is obvious that if you're putting liquid into the tower and a valve in its outlet is closed, the liquid cannot go anywhere and it will start to accumulate. And that, that's exactly what happened. Now, valves come in very many different shapes and sizes and your standard physical ergonomics can apply to this you know how big is the hand wheel how high will it be from the ground how much effort does it take to turn and again these are all very valid concerns um, from a design perspective and, and general operability but just bear in mind that none of them have any application to the accident itself it was not whether the operator could open the valve in fact in this case the the, the, the valve in question was operated remotely from the control room with a mouse click on a screen the problem was that due to a human error, meant that the valve wasn't open when it needed to be. This occurred because there was some confusing information in the procedure and poor communications. So I'm hoping you'll see it's not physical ergonomics, but there's clearly a lot of human factors at play here. So one of the key principles that must be applied in these sorts of sectors and where we have these hazards is the hierarchy of risk control. So that means our first approach is always to try and eliminate the hazard and reduce it before we put in some other sort of control. Because clearly, uh, if you don't have the hazard, it can't cause harm. As a, a very famous a person in um, process safety, a guy called Trevor Klett, said, what you don't have can't leak. So that's the principle we're always trying to apply. And there is a danger that human factors is often seen as being focused on operational controls, which appear very low in that hierarchy. Um, they're easier to apply because you don't have to go and change any steel work or use new technology, but they're equally less reliable. Bear in mind that we don't expect the risks to become zero. These are hazardous operations, no matter what we do. The requirement is we have to reduce risks as low as reasonably practicable or ALARP. Again, this is a term that will really help if you understand this. This means we have to identify all the options that may reduce risk but have a process for deciding which ones we need to apply. We're not going to get the risks to zero in the high hazard industry, but we, they must be managed continuously. Um, it's not just a case of us deciding we think the risk is acceptable, it's good to go. 
we need to have processes uh, to go through to demonstrate that we have carried out suitable and sufficient analyses that support an opinion that we feel the risks are ALARP. And that applies as much for the engineering side as it does to the human factors element. So you need to be thinking about how can I apply my human factors and ergonomics to contribute to that, that discussion process. You can't just come in and say this is what you think is good. You've got to be able to demonstrate that that's the case. The process industry has a very widely used method for considering what can go wrong. So you know, it's a, it's a recognised process and you would have to demonstrate that you've used it or something equally as good or better if you wanted to do something different. In this case, the process is called HAZOP, which stands for Hazard and Operability. Um, and yes, you really should be aware of this method if you want to work in this industry, um, because it is quite an effective way of identifying possible human errors. It will identify the potential consequences of those errors and the risk controls. So the method works by dividing the plant into areas, which it calls nodes. A set of parameters are used then or considered, things like flow, temperature, pressure, because those are the things that can be different for different parts of a, a process or a plant. Deviations are then proposed for each of those parameters. What if it's more than was expected, less than expected, or just different? So more flow or less flow. Credible causes are identified and, and their consequences or potential consequences are considered. So where we think there is a cons potential consequence, it's well, what do we have in place uh, to prevent that scenario? They are called safeguards. In this very simplified case, you can see that no bottoms flow would have been would come out as the deviation uh, and we would have seen the, the closed valve as the cause. The consequence would, be, consequence would be a liquid increase in the tower that may overflow to the ventron. So in that case, we would have some safeguards in place that maybe include startup procedures that make sure the valve if was opened um, and a high level alarm that would warn if the level was higher than it should be. Now, having applied this to the Texas City accident after the event, um, you can, you know, it, it, it kind of illustrates how that um, picture could be told. The idea of HAZOP actually is to uh, apply it um, proactively uh, to pr predict potential problems and make sure the right safeguards are in place. In this case, you can see at Texas City on the day, the safeguards were very heavily reliant on human operators. They had to follow a procedure and they had to respond to alarms if they occurred. Now, bearing in mind the hierarchy of risk controls, you can see that actually this is hitting very low in that hierarchy. And I'm sure you as a human factors people could see some potential downsides of reliance on, on operator actions, um, especially when you start to think about human behaviours. Would there be a reason why the operators might have purposefully increased the level in the tower during startup? Um, so would have been biased to expect deviations from the procedure and expect to see the alarm. So what on paper um, to an engineer particularly might see like a very effective um, back, a safeguard, you might start to question, well, you know, what is the, the operator behavior likely to be at the time? And could that have contributed to that scenario happening more, more likely than, than maybe you would have expected? Another method that is becoming more widely used in the process and coma industries is called LOPA, which stands for Layers of Protection Analysis. This is a systematic way of analysing safeguards to make sure that they are good enough to manage the risks of a scenario. LOPA is usually carried out after a HAZOP, so these two methods work closely together and it will help if you understand them a little bit. A very simplistic overview is that it considers a range of scenarios and first identifies how they can occur. This is described as the initiating event. The LOPA then examines the layers of protection that are in place and it gives guidance about how effective they can be. It may consider how map mitigation to reduce the consequences of an event may also be considered to reduce risks. The idea is that for higher risk scenarios it should be avoided by highly effective layers of protection. As you can see there can be some significant human factors considerations in LOPA. You can certainly inquire about how the likelihood of human error in relation to the initiating event and also how much reliance can be placed on the operator to respond to alarms, all valid questions for a human factors person. You can also ask about how the reliability of engineered layers of protection can be ensured, because although they may operate automatically without human intervention at the time, 
they will inevitably be designed, installed and maintained by people. So even introducing engineered controls doesn't take the human factors away from it all. Now, one area where human factors has great potential is the control room. Many critical roles are performed in the control room on most modern plants. The physical ergonomics, again, is relevant, but don't get too carried away. It is reasonable to check the height of the desk. It's appropriate for the users. But make sure you understand the context before you get too far down the recommendations. For example, in this picture here, you'll notice the double stack of screens. Now, ergonomists have been known to be very concerned about this arrangement because of, you know, it's requiring the operator to look up what's the potential for neck strain. Now, I've spoken to many operators working with this arrangement and they've never complained about it and they've never identified any it as a cause of discomfort. And the reason is in the context is that they do not spend much time looking up at those screens. They're used for quick glances every now and then to see what was, what is happening. If they want to perform more in-depth work, they instinctively use one of the lower screens because they find that more comfortable, you know, and that complies with all our DSC guidelines. The accident that Texas City highlighted that it was the way that data was presented on the screen that was most significant human factors in the control room, not the physical ergonomics. Unfortunately, the displays are often designed with little consideration of how humans perceive information, and this is something where you can certainly uh, apply your expertise. One principle is to, uh, to understand is that everything in life, including processed plants, have to be kept in balance. The amount of material entering must equal the amount leaving. The same with the energy. If the operator cannot determine this easily because of poor data displays, they're likely to miss situations where something is going where it shouldn't, which is exactly what happened at Texas City. So for my final slide, I just wanted to mention some other human factors issues that contributed to the Texas City accident where general human factors principles can be applied. For example, fatigue. Hopefully no one needs to be told that people working for 30 days without a day off are high risk. But shift work is a fact of life at process plants because they operate 24-7, 365 days a year. It's very common in this industry now for people to work 12 hour shifts, which instinctively seems problematic. And the alternative of an eight hour shift would seem to be better. Here, the context is important. Working shorter shifts means there are more shift handovers each day and means people have fewer recovery days. You need to understand all the relevant issues before diving in with your suggestions. Critical communication such as shift handover is one area where the process industry, in my opinion, has not been very good. So if you have anything to offer in that topic, that would be very welcome. There's definitely room for improvement in procedures in the process industry and the coma industries, but I suspect that applies in other places as well. And supervision is a critical function, but we rely on people being competent and being able to work on their own initiatives most of the time without someone monitoring everything that, that they do. Overall, I would just remind you that the normal health and safety risks are relevant to the process industry, just like any other. But it's that understanding of the, the risks of major accidents and how they can be controlled, where human factors can make the greatest contribution. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing if you have any questions or observations later.